Okay, we're here uh, talking more about the uh, sampling theorem. Uh, last time we did kind of a pictorial representation of the sampling theorem, and at least two of you commented on that. I asked, what did you like best about the course so far? And you said the, uh, the geometric sort of interpretation of the sampling theorem where we had a lot of graphs and things like that. And I think I mentioned to you before that it, having worked with mathematicians, I know that mathematicians do not like to admit that they have little pictures in their heads, but they do have little pictures in their heads. And they try to write all this mathy sort of equations without telling anybody their pictures. I think engineers are very different. We uh, start with the pictures and we use the pictures to explain things. So hopefully, uh, well, I hope not hopefully, that is better. I think that's a better way to explain things is to tell people the pictures in your heads. And I'm sure there's some mathematicians that uh, would disagree with me, but not many. Okay, any questions at all about uh, any of the material? The sampling theorem thus far? You'll notice that I have not given you uh, homework as of yet. I plan to do that uh, today. And uh, hopefully we can, if you, if you have a chance to look at it, we can talk about it the next couple of times we meet. And then we'll have it due a week from Thursday. This is just on the sampling theorem, okay? So with that, let me go ahead and get started. And I will get started by sharing my screen. If I can get all the other stuff out of the way. Okay. I got too many windows open. Do you know what I did this last week? I, um, I, I abandoned my shorts. It's getting, it's, it's getting cold enough where, yeah, the shorts just don't, I, they don't make it anymore. So, um, so I, I'm for the first time in a long sleeve shirt, and that's very, that's very nice and cozy, I guess. Okay, let's uh, let's talk with the Fourier series. I think the last time we went through this geometrical proof, which was, which was here. This was the last. Um, this was the last interpretation. What happens intuitively, and then what happens in the alternate domain. And I think you can see here what does happen. We also talked about the idea that there's aliasing. <clears throat> and uh, here, here's the exa example of an alias system. If the high frequency sinusoid is sampled insufficiently, you get these points, which you can see here. And you can see those points correspond to the sampling of a low frequency sine wave too. So that high frequency and that low frequency get messed up, don't they? So that's one explanation of aliasing. We also showed a YouTube video, which I won't repeat, uh, showing this uh, showing this relation, showing aliasing happening. Many times you see on television, I, we probably can't get it here because of the high resolution, but when we had low resolution television, people used to wear striped shirts. Do you ever see that? They wear striped shirts and it looks like there were these patterns kind of floating around the striped shirts. Anybody relate to that? Yeah, well, maybe not. Well, it turns out that the stripes on the shirt were at a higher frequency than the sampling that the camera was doing. So therefore, you had you had confusion of the low of the uh, high frequencies, which was the spatial frequencies, which were the lines on the shirt, with the low frequencies that were only able to be captured by uh, the low frequencies, which were able to be captured by the CCD array or the scanning or whatever technique you use to capture the video. So aliasing is our friend all around uh, every place. Okay, uh, I want to go through another couple of uh, illustrations of the sampling theorem. One of the things I think is curious is that we said that every Fourier theorem had a corresponding Fourier dual. And the Fourier dual comes about when you switch the roles of the frequency in the time domain. And um, uh, this not only happens for Fourier transform pairs, re a rectangle function Fourier transforms to a sink. So a sink would Fourier transform to a rectangle function. But it also happens for theorems. There's Fourier duals for theorem. So the shift theorem in time corresponds to multi multiplying by e to the j in the frequency domain. So you switch that around and multiplying by e to the j in the time domain corresponds to a shift in the frequency domain. Those are Fourier duals. Well, it turns out that the Fourier dual of the, um, 
of, of the sampling theorem is the Fourier series, believe it or not. And if you look at Shannon's original 1948 paper, if I recall, this is the way he derives the Fourier the, or the sampling theorem. He uses the Fourier series. And basically, the idea is, is pretty simple. We start with the frequency domain. And we know that the uh, Fourier, Fourier series corresponds to periodic functions. So we're going to have a period here of 2b. So we know that the, we know that the, um, that the signal that we're dealing with is band limited. And so the bandwidth is b. So here we have a b. Here we have a minus b, right? Now think of replicating this, uh, this hump in a periodic fashion. So we're going to take this one hump and we are going to duplicate it. And when we duplicate it, what do we make? We make a periodic function, don't we? Right? And here comes the Fourier dual. If we were to expand this periodic function, we would get Fourier series coefficients times e to the minus j. Now this Fourier series expression is for all of the, uh, all of the periods, right? Since it's a periodic function. But we're not gonna have all of the periods of the periodic function. We're gonna chop it off with a rectangle. In other words, we're gonna have a periodic function and we'll chop it off with a, a, a rectangle that just preserves the zeroth order spectrum. Is that okay? And now what we have to do is simply substitute into the Fourier series uh, coefficient equation that C sub n is equal to 1 over the period. What's the period? It's 2b times the integral over a period from minus b to b of the function. And the function there is x of u times e to, the my, e to the j 2 pi. There should be a 2 pi here, and then it's over 2b but the two twos cancel each other, so we don't have to worry about those, okay? And you'll notice this is exactly, this is exactly the inverse Fourier transform of x of u, isn't it? This is exactly the inverse Fourier transform of x of u, except that we have the following. What I'm doing is writing this Fourier kernel in a different way. I'm just, whoops, there should be a two here. I'm just writing this Fourier kernel in a different fashion. You can see this Fourier kernel, man, that's terrible. Let me try it again. E to the J two pi uh, U N over two B. My end is not very pretty. But you see, those are exactly the same thing. The, uh, this, this Fourier kernel is exactly the same as this, right? And you notice this is exactly the Fourier series, or the, the inverse Fourier transform, except that what? Instead of a t, we have an n over 2b, don't we? We have an n over 2b. So this whole thing becomes nothing more than the inverse transform of the, of the function, which is x of, not of time, but of n over 2b. And then we have this 1 over tb that we have out in front. Is that OK? So then we have x of u is equal to 1 over 2b times the summation over n. And we've figured out what the c sub n is. What's the c sub n? That's, uh, that's x over n x of n over 2b times this other stuff, e, and I'm going to put the two pi's in there. So it turns out the Fourier series coefficient of the periodic expansion of the periodic function in the frequency domain has Fourier coefficients of samples of the original signal. Is that okay? And here's the good part. Now we want to inverse Fourier transform. 
we want the inverse Fourier transform. And I'm not going to go through the details except to say that we have this, 1 over 2b times this. What does this inverse Fourier transform to? Yeah, it, it, it inverse Fourier, yeah, it inverse Fourier transform to a sinc function. Now, this e to the minus j uh, 2 pi u n over 2b, if we multiply by an exponential in the frequency domain, what do we do in the time domain? We shift, don't we? We shift in the time domain. So we get the summation over n. And we get this sinc function, which is the inverse Fourier transform of this rectangle function. And because of the scaling theorem, we get a 2b out here in front. And then because of this multiplying by e to the minus j uh, 2 pi u does a shift in the time domain, that's the reason we get a minus, well, we get, let's see, maybe we should do it this way, minus n over 2b. That's the shift. And of course, if we simplify it, we get the very nice expression for the sampling theorem that we've seen before. So that's the sampling theorem we had before. Can you see that? Isn't that interesting that the sampling theorem is nothing more than the Fourier dual of the Fourier series? Okay, you with me? I'm going to give you a, a a proof now, which is due to Athanasius Populus. And he's the one that originated it, and he's the one that presented it. And you remember I talked about Paul Erdos and the idea that he said that there were some proofs in mathematics that belonged in God's book. They were so short, they were so eloquent that you couldn't improve on them. And this, this is the proof of the sampling theorem that belongs in God's book, at least in Erdos's definition of what God's book is. And this is, uh, this is due to, uh, again, Populus, and I call it Populus's proof in honor of him. But the idea from Populus's proof is as follows. He's going to take a, from minus b to b, a complex exponential, and this complex exponential is going to be e to the minus j 2 pi ut. Now, this is going to be a function of u, so we treat t as a, very, uh, as a uh, constant in there. So we're going to take the Fourier transform of this e to the j 2 pi ut over a finite uh, interval from minus b to b. And this, of course, is going to be duplicated. So it's going to be periodic. So whatever that looks like in this one period, it, 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 the period in, continues to, um, to do itself, to, to repeat itself, to do itself. Anyway, it turns out if you do that, guess what the Fourier series is? Here's the Fourier series e to the j stuff. And these are the Fourier series coefficients. It's just beautiful that it works out that way. Uh, and uh, so what we do is we substitute into, we, we, uh, we, we look at x of t now. x of t is equal to, and this is the integral from minus b to b of the original function x of u times e to the j 2 pi n u. So what we're doing is we are substituting into the inverse Fourier transform we're substituting into this. Okay, this is the inverse Fourier transform, right? So we are taking this expression and we are substituting it into this, into this uh, Fourier series kernel. Is that good? And once we do that, this is what we get.
Let me say it again. We have this very unusual, and this is the key to Populus's truth, proof. We have an e to the j 2 pi ut, which can be expressed this way in terms of a Fourier series, where t is basically considered a constant here. It's one that goes along for the ride when you're computing the Fourier series coefficient. Then we take this e to the j 2 pi ut and we substitute it into the inverse Fourier transform definition, and that gives rise to this relationship that we see here. And we can see immediately that this, just like in the Fourier series, this is what e to the j 2 pi nu over, over 2b, right? All of this integral, as we had before, simplifies to x of n over 2b. Times the sink of 2b t minus n. That is one beautiful proof. So let me walk through it one more time. We do a Fourier series expansion around this function. Why do we do it? Because it works, <laughs> okay? We do a Fourier series around this for over the interval of minus b to b, and that gives us this Fourier series. Then we substitute this Fourier series in for the Fourier series coefficient in the inverse Fourier transform. When we do this, we get this equation that I'm checking off here. And what is left in this integral turns out to be, as we saw before with the Fourier series proof, the sample, uh, the samples of the signal in the original domain. So this, uh, every once in a while, I don't know if you guys are into this, but I see beautiful mathematics and I go, oh, it's like my wife sees a beautiful flower and she's, or she sees a, she sees a, a field full of roses. She goes, oh, that's beautiful. There, God is there. I look at this and I say, oh, that's beautiful. I, I see, I see just total simplicity in what is done. Beautiful, beautiful simplicity. But of course, this doesn't have the intuitive uh, appeal for example, that the Fourier series does, nor does it have the appeal that the when we draw a bunch of graphs and we, we picture what happens there with the convolutions and everything. It isn't as aesthetic as that, but in terms of brevity and conciseness, it's very, very nice. Now, let me ask you this question. Um, if we sample, we're, we're gonna look at some of the properties of the sampling theorem. Suppose we sample x of t is equal to a sinusoid. What's the largest frequency in this sinusoid in terms of hertz? It's b hertz, isn't it? That's the reason I used the figure b here. You agree with that? Not if you agree, okay. However, if we look at the sine, and we look at the sine, of 2 b 2 pi bt and we sample at intervals of 1 over 2 b guess what we get x of t equals 0 <laughs> all of the sa david's right all of the samples are exactly 0 right and if we interpolated this, we get a function that was identically zero everywhere. So my question to you is what went wrong here? Why doesn't the sampling theorem apply here? Because it has to be uh, bigger, the frequency than twice. Because it has to be bigger. That's right. <coughs> Excuse me. You remember me mentioning the only time you got into problems with the Dirac Delta is when uh, when what happened, when a Dirac delta was on the edge. So if you ask, for example, the integral from zero to one of delta of t, you cannot answer that question, right? Because the delta t, the delta t is at the origin 
And if you integrate from zero to one, the question is, do you include the delta function? Do you exclude it? Do you only include half? Do you include three-fourths of it? Do you remember us talking about that? So it's these edge effects that are very, very bad. Well, here's what happens to the sinusoid. The sinusoid has a Fourier transform, which looks like this. That's the Fourier transform. If this is x of t, then this is what x of u is equal to. Right? Now, what if we do, what if we replicate in accordance to that uh, geometric interpretation that I gave you? Well, we'd get this thing replicated over a period, and that would look like this. We would get this replicated over here, which would look like this. So you see, you see what's happening? These delta functions cancel each other out, don't they? You have one delta function subtracting off another delta function. And this happens all down the line. So all of the delta functions are canceled out by each other. So we're going to get zero. So the answer, David's answer is correct, that especially if you have a frequency, a significant frequency component at the bandwidth, you better sample in excess of the so-called Nyquist rate of 2b. Because if we had this signal and we had a replication which looked like this, which is just sampling a little bit above the Nyquist frequency, uh, you can see that there would be no aliasing, right? And we could come back and we could chop this off and get the sinusoid. So do you see that? So we must sample in excess of 2B samples per second. Not a quality, but greater than. Now, if you have a band-limited signal that is kind of tapers off at minus B and B like this, okay, then you probably don't have to worry about it because there's no conflicting direct deltas here, right? It's only when you have a significant frequency response here. So therefore, the conclusion is, is that the Nyquist rate, exactly the Nyquist rate of 2B samples per second, and that is the, that is the uh, sampling rate, and it's sometimes referred to as the Nyquist rate under the Bell, uh, named after the Bell Labs engineer that figured it out. So in general, you have to exceed the Nyquist rate um, unless if you have any delta functions kind of sitting at the bandwidths. So that's the reason that exactly the Nyquist rate does not work for this signal, right? Because you have delta functions sitting at both ends. So very, 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 I think, interesting property. Question. Um, why don't we have the same problem when we uh, take samples at uh, the, uh, um, that capture the extremes? Well, it's because, it's because these points, remember we said that a point in a function doesn't matter? That if we had, if we had, let's go back to this curve here. If we had exactly this point and we just took this one point, say it b over two, and we took this single point and we put it up here, and let's do it over here just to re uh, maintain the symmetry here. Guess what? This would inverse Fourier transform to exactly the same thing as if those points were not displaced. 
They have measure zero. They contribute nothing to the nothing to the uh, inverse transform, which is an integral. The integral over these things is zero. There's there's nothing that happens there. So therefore, if you have a single point which overlaps and in which there is ambiguity, you don't care if there's a single point. The only thing, the only time that you have to matter is when this when these single points overlap are such that they have an infinite sort of area. Okay. And that would be the case with a direct delta function, not an infinite area, but an infinite height, if you will. And that's what happens with direct deltas. So when I duplicate, if this is just a finite number right here at the intersection, if I double that number or multiply it by 20 or multiply it by 5,000, it isn't going to make a difference in terms of the analysis. That never happens in engineering problems. Never do we have single displaced points right? Not in continuous signals, maybe in, in, in discrete time signals we do, but not in continuous signals. Does that answer your question, David? No, I, I was wondering more about uh, like, um, why don't we see the uh, um, zero uh, why don't we still see zero when we uh, sample it uh, uh, like um, the Nyquist phase, rate at at the Nyquist rate and at phase uh, pi over two? Well, I tell you, you're going to have. Let's get together offline on this because okay. I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, an example that you're thinking about. If you're thinking about a specific example, we can talk about this. But what I've done is answer it in general. So the general answer is, if there's Dirac deltas on the edge of anything, you have to watch out for it. So here we found out that we had to watch out for that Dirac delta lying at minus B and B. And so we always have to worry about that sort of thing. Um, and that's the only place that Dirac deltas don't work in my experience. Otherwise, they're functionally really good. You can use them in great algebra and do great and wonderful things with them. Uh, when we don't have Dirac deltas at the uh, at the bandwidth, even if it goes down and it has a brick wall and it comes down, even that's okay. We can still duplicate, and if we you know if we uh, if we overlap at a point um, or, or not a point, um, doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Let me let me go ahead and move on then. So that is an interesting property of the transform. One of the things about the uh, Fourier series, or I'm sorry, the um, one of the things about the sampling theorem is that it converges uniformly. Remember that we said with the Fourier series that we had Gibbs phenomena? That if we did the Fourier series of a square wave, it kind of grew ears, if you will. You remember that? Um, and not only that, but these ears never disappeared. I mean, if we had ears that asymptotically went away, that would be fine, but that doesn't happen. Those ears get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and they pinch to a point, but they never go away. This was the problem that was seen with Michelson in his Fourier series machine that he made. If you recall the story, and he went out and he said, what happens? And who was the guy that responded to him? Gibbs? Gibbs came back and says, oh, I, I understand the problem. It doesn't converge uniformly. It converges in a, in a uh, RMS way. Well, it does turn out that the sampling theorem converges uniformly. That is, if we have a truncated sampling theorem and only sum from minus n to n, that is the limit as n goes to infinity of x of t minus x of n of t is equal to zero. In other words, the sampling theorem converges at every point. There's no equivalent of a Gibbs phenomenon in the sampling theorem. And this kind of makes sense because again, band limited functions are smooth. And so you wouldn't expect any, any problems with, uh, with, with interpolating a nice smooth function. So the convergence for the cardinal series is uniform. And now we talk about Parseval. We, man, we have a, had a lot of Parseval's theorems. 
And Percival relates the energy in one representation of a signal to another representation. I always like to know historically who the person was. I never looked up Percival, so I did it here. His name was Marc Antoini. Anybody know French? Is it Antoini? I think it's Antoine. <laughs> that would be more politically acceptable. Antoine. <laughs> Uh, that'd be terrible if I introduce him. Good to meet you, Mark Antoini. <laughs> what what is it again, Antoine? Okay, Mark Antoine Parsival, and he was uh, in uh, 19th century. Well, his his name sounds very French, and he was he's most famous for Parsival's theorem. And I'm sure that there's Parsival's theorems all over the place. You see them in orthogonal series. We saw them in Fourier series. We saw them in the Fourier transform. Well, there is a Parsival's theorem for the sampling theorem as, as well. Here's the Parsival's theorem for the sampling theorem. Again, it relates the energy in one domain to the energy in the other one. And it turns out if you do the energy of a band-limited signal and then you sample it at or above the Nyquist rate, you get uh, you get you get this expression, and uh, it turns out that we can express, as you can see on the bottom of the screen here, this energy, the energy of the signal, by summing the squares of the samples. Isn't that interesting, right? So we can either get the energy of the signal by integrating the, ma the magnitude squared or by summing the magnitude squared of all of the samples. Just as a sanity check here, say that uh, X has some sort of units, I don't know, of, of giblets. I don't know. It could, be, it could be anything. It has a fixed unit. Uh, so whatever this unit is, the units of X, be it a voltage or a current or whatever, the um, expression for the energy has units of whatever the unit is for x of t squared, right? Times time. So E has energy related to time times the units of the signal. Now let's go down here. We have this, which is the energy of the signal, right? That's the energy of the signal. And this, well, no, it's not the energy of the signal, but this has units of whatever X of T had. And you'll notice that one over two B has units of what? Time. One over two B also has units of, si of time. Two B is a frequency. And so therefore one over two B has, uni has units of time. So that, that's the, uh, that's a little sanity check. It's kind of fun to check that. I have a problem, which I'll probably assign you, which asks things like, well, if X is voltage, what, is, what are the units of, uh, of the Fourier transform? Let me ask you this. Yeah, let me ask you that. Anybody know this? Say we're doing the Fourier transform of a voltage, X of T. I ran off my board here. And that had a Fourier transform of X of U. And X of T had units of volts. What would the units of X of U, its Fourier transform be? Again, this has units of volts. And the question is, what is the units of X of U? Are they volt seconds? What, say, say again? Volt, volt seconds. Volt seconds, that's right. Now, how did you get that? That's exactly right, Adam. Uh, looking at the formula for the Fourier transform, you're integrating with respect to time, so you'd multiply by time. Exactly. A Adam got it right, and he did it exactly the way I would do it, which is the right way to do it, I guess. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Let me separate these. So this is the definition of the Fourier transform. This has units of volts. E, at least in Fourier analysis, E to any power is unitless. It has to be. 
Because if you take E to the one volt, what does E to the one volt mean? Or E to the one amp or E to the one watt? You know, it doesn't make any sense. You just take E to the number. And you'll notice this is, this is borne out by the fact that U is in hertz and T is in seconds. So if we multiply hertz by seconds, that's going to be unitless. So this has no units at all. So the other, only other unit, as Adam mentioned, was the um, measure of time. So therefore, X of U has, has units of volts, volt, seconds. Or, if you will, volts per hertz, right? Maybe volts per hertz is more intuitive. So with this in mind, let's, uh, let's return then to the topic, which is Parseval's theorem for cardinal series. Let's see how I do here. Yes. You know, Chris showed me how to erase, but I can't get, I can't get my screen to erase the nice way Chris did. Okay, how, how do you prove this energy? Well, the energy, if we, if we copy here, is equal to the integral of, instead of x of t, I'm going to put down here, I'm going to put down here, um, x of t times x of t. So one of the x of t's I'm going to do this way. Excuse me. And then I'm going to multiply it by another x of t, except it's going to be, I need to use a different dummy variable here for my summation so I don't get my n's and my m's confused here. Is that okay? So I've simply substituted in the cardinal series for x of t here, and then the cardinal series for x of t here. In one case, I'm summing over n. In the other case, I'm summing over m. Now I'm going to shuffle the summations and integrations. So if I do this, I get the summation over n, summation over m of x of n over 2b. By the way, I have a problem here. You notice this is the magnitude squared, or the magnitude squared. So I actually should put an x conjugate here, since the magnitude of x is equal to x times this complex conjugate, right? x is equal to x times this complex conjugate. So I'm going to make the second sum the conjugate. Is that OK? And if I make the second sum the conjugate, that's, that's good. So it's n over 2b. x of m over 2b uh, times the integral over the sinks. Oops, this should be conjugate. I have no idea how to do that integral. Anybody have an idea how we could do that integral? There's a theorem we need to appeal to. See, the, um, we involve taking the Fourier transform, um, uh, convolving the uh, rectangle functions, and then 
You could do uh, that. Back. You could do that, but you'd hurt yourself. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what would happen. Here, here's what I'm looking for. The integral of x times y conjugate is equal to the integral of x times y conjugate du. Do you remember that theorem? I said, do you remember that theorem? Yes, because we said there's a special case here when x is equal to y. And we get Parseval's theorem. Well, I'm trying to put, trying to put five pounds in a two pound bag here. Uh, yeah, if x is equal to y, we have the integral over x squared dt equal the integral over the magnitude of x squared du. Do you remember this theorem? This was Parseval's theorem. If x was equal to y. You guys don't remember that? Was this a dream? Was this a dream I had? Um, I think I remember hearing it. I don't. Okay, I let, 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 let's re, let's re grasp it at the time. Or it's why. in my notes, so you definitely talked about it. Okay, we did talk about it. Um, I don't know what I just did. Okay, I guess we're down here. Um, let me just remind you about it here. This was, this was um, in chapter two, and it's the integral of t over x of t y conjugate t equals the integral over the frequency domain of x of u times y conjugate of u. Okay, this will be something that uh, I'll ask you guys in the next exam. This is something called the power theorem. And we proved it, we proved it in class. And a special case uh, is when X is equal to Y. When X is equal to Y, we get the following. I'm not gonna put in the arguments, I think you can see them. Right? In other words, this, this second expression is a special case of, this, of the theorem on top when x is equal to y. Do you recall what we call this theorem? The one with the line underneath it? Yes. Parseval's theorem. That's Parseval's theorem. Exactly right. Again, we said Parseval's got a lot of things named after him. Okay, so then with that in mind, let's look at the problem that we had before. We have the integral of T of the sink. This is gonna be my X times my Y. Is that okay? So I maintain that this Fourier transforms according to the power theorem to the Fourier transform of this, which is what? One over two B 
times a rectangle of u over 2b. e to the um, minus j, let's see, no, plus j, 2 pi, actually it doesn't matter, n um, n u over 2b. That's the Fourier transform of this. The Fourier transform over here is the same thing. But notice we have to conjugate it, right? We have a little conjugate here. So this has to be e to the minus j and u over 2b. And all of this is times du. How do we know whether the um, uh, second sink function was already conjugated? Well, if you want to, you can put sink conjugate here, and it's the same thing. Yeah. So since the sink is real, right? It doesn't matter. Yeah. So, so then um, it, would, it seems that it would be ambiguous whether the um, Fourier transform should have a minus or a plus in the. Well, it turns out if if, if one is minus, the other one's plus. If one is plus, the other one's minus. That's the important part. Okay. So this is the integral, and the cool thing part, the cool part about this is we can take this rectangle, and what does the rectangle do? It just chops things off, doesn't it? So we can integrate, we can integrate from minus b to b, and just forget these rectangle functions. And then we get one over two b squared, times e to the j, 2 pi n minus m u over 2b. Now, kudos for anybody that can evaluate this integral in their head. It turns out that this is periodic, right? And what we're doing is, and this is the period of that periodicity. So we're literally taking from minus b to b, and we're taking something like a sinusoid. Yeah, so it's zero. Uh, yeah. So it's going to be zero. In other words, these are orthogonal to each other. If you've ever had orthogonal functions, the e to the j's are orthogonal functions. Except when, this is true as long as n is not equal to m. Something special happens though when n is equal to m. So David is right. If n is not, if n is not equal to m, we're, we're integrating over a periodic function uh, a period or a number of periods of a periodic function, that's just going to be zero or of a sinusoid, not a periodic function. What is it if n is equal to m? Uh, 2b. That's right. If n is equal to m, this integrand is equal to 1, it integrates to, to 2b, and then so we have the 1 over 2b. Very interesting. And we can write this in our old notation as 1 over 2b times a chronic or delta. It's equal to one over two B times the chronic or delta. So with that, let's go back to here. And uh, we, just, we just showed with all the stuff that we did using the power theorem that this is equal to one over two B 
times the Kronecker delta, N minus M. And there's two ways we can do this. Let's do it with the uh, M here. The, the 2B was not the square? No, it wasn't. Uh, the one, two over two B, B, one over 2B square before the, two, the chronic delta. It was, it was a squared. But when we evaluated this, this integral for 1, it brought down a 2B. OK. Right? Yeah, so the, the squared went away, and we just are left with 1 over 2B. Good thought, though. So we just figured this out. And what does this summation over the Kronecker delta give? So it's equal to the whole sum is equal to x at uh, um, n equals to m. Uh, so yeah, x of m over two b. Yeah, so it's it's like it's like convol Yeah, so it's, this is the sifting property of the Kronecker delta. We get back this sum and evaluated at n is equal to m. Okay. And so you can see that we have derived then that the energy, these two combine, of course, to the magnitude squared of x, correct? And therefore, we have shown the Parseval's theorem. So we have shown that the energy, in summary, that the energy can be written as the integral of the signal squared dt, or it can be written as the sum of all the sample squared. Both of them are viable equations for computing the energy. This is really good for us in DSP, right? Because if we sample a, a signal fast enough, it doesn't mean we have to interpolate and then integrate. It just means we need to add up the signals, uh, the signal samples, and we can get the energy of the signal. OK. So that's Parseval's theorem for the cardinal series. Again, if you, if you get, a, get away from all of the little details, it says that the energy can be computed this way or the energy can be computed this way. The energy can be computed from the original signal or it can be computed from the samples of the signal. Last thing I want to talk about, any questions on this, by the way? The last thing I want to talk about is, um, believe it or not, this is a paper I did a long time ago, and it's received many, many uh, citations. It's incredibly simple observation. And what the heck is this over here? I don't know what that is. It's an incredibly simple observations, but here's the point. If you sample at the Nyquist rate, all of your samples are basically independent of each other. If you sample in excess of the Nyquist rate, in other words, sample uh, maybe at 1.3 or 2.6 times the Nyquist rate, all of a sudden the samples become interdependent. I'm going to illustrate geometrically a very easy way for one to compute lost samples. So if you have samples from a signal and it's oversampled and you lose a sample, is there a way that you can regain the sample? Do you understand? So this can only be done if you oversample. If you sample at the Nyquist rate, all of the samples are going to be uh, independent of each other. If you, if, you, if you sample in excess of the Nyquist rate, then you have dependency. 
For example, consider uh, sampling at twice the Nyquist rate. If you sample it twice the Nyquist rate, you can throw away every other sample and you can regain it, right? Because you, you still have enough samples to interpolate and you can interpolate all the lost ones. Well, it turns out you can also uh, restore those lost samples if you sample a little bit in excess of the Nyquist rate. And here's how. We're gonna start with a signal we're going to start with the signal, and here is the corresponding here is the corresponding spectrum of the signal. And if we sample it, we saw that if we sample the signal, what do we do? We replicate it. Now, if we replicate the signal, if we replicate the signal, there's going to be areas where there is going to be zero. Correct? There's going to be gaps among the spectrum. And we're going to assume that the signal has a bandwidth of B, yet we're sampling at two W samples per second, which is greater than two B samples per second. And so we're going to have gaps here. Okay, we're going to lose a sample. And by the way, I'm showing you for a single sample. This can be this can be generalized to Six, losing six samples or 20,000 samples. It turns out the more samples you lose, the more sensitive this becomes to noise. So if you have any, any noise in your measurement, it becomes no good. And the faster you sample, the, the, the faster you sample, the greater you sample over the Nyquist rate, the better the noise reconstruction is. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to the next slide, and we are going to look at just the sample at the origin. Is that okay? Now we know that the sample of the origin of the sampled signal is x of zero. What is x of zero? That's the, that's the value of the sample at the origin times a direct delta. The direct delta uh, is the, uh, well, is, is the delta function and x of zero is the area under the delta function. What is the Fourier transform of the direct delta? It's one, right? Fourier transform of a direct delta is one. So the Fourier transform of x of O times delta of t is going to be to equal to a constant, which is equal to x of o. That's going to be the lost sample, right? So very, very quickly, I think you can see, can you, anybody see what happens? When we subtract the two, Here's the known samples on the left. The sample of the origin has been lost, and we're, we're going to set it equal to zero. So if we subtract this, if we subtract the lost sample from the known samples, and we get the samples with the missing sample on here, that's the same in the frequency domain by taking the duplicated spectrum, subtracting off the value at the origin, and guess what we get? Guess what we get? We get the original uh, spec spectrum replicated, except now it's shoved down. And how much is it shoved down? It's shoved down x of zero. So this should literally be minus x of zero here. So how do we find out the lost sample? We take the spectrum, uh, assume, uh, we take the spectrum and then we simply look at the value of the spectrum at this point or this point, and that gives us the value of the lost spectrum. Or, I'm sorry, the value of the lost sample, the value of the lost sample. That's pretty easy, isn't it? Yeah, it looks too easy. <laughs> it looks too easy. Um, extending it to, to higher to higher cases where you lose three or four corresponds to solving linear linear um, linear uh, collections of equations. So you have to you have to solve. Uh, you could use you can do that by inverting a matrix or something. So yeah, it looks incredibly simple. So the point is, the, the main takeaway here is that if you oversample, you have redundancy in your samples. And this is really good. And this is why, for example, on DVDs and things that we sample in excess of the Nyquist rate, because doing so allows greater noise immunity. We haven't talked in here because it's outside of the scope of the course, that what happens if you're taking samples 
and these samples are subject to some sort of noise. So there's some sort of uncertainty here. This uncertainty could be in terms of measurement noise. It could be a round off error, okay? Because all of these things are truncated. They're not, they, they don't go on and on forever in terms of their accuracy. And so you have tr uh, truncation error. And in all cases, if you sample at a greater, uh, at a greater rate, you do generate more noise immunity in your interpolation process. So this is something which has been established, but something we're not going to go through here. So there's a number of reasons to oversample and ju just not constrain yourself to the Nyquist rate. The other thing is, is that true band limited signals uh, really don't exist. You ever seen a true band limited signal? If you look at a signal, probably it's like this, right? And you might call this the bandwidth before it totally goes to zero. Okay, and uh, so there's a little bit of uh, slop in here. So this gets us to the next. Uh, this gets us to the next question: Is what does this? How is this applicable in terms of sampling real signals? In terms of sampling real signals, we're going to assume the following: T here is not equal to a period, but T is equal to the. the time a signal plays. So this is X of T. And if you listen to a song or something, that song starts and stops, doesn't it? One of the things you can show is that band-limited signals are analytic and band-limited signals go on forever and ever and we actually get into philosophy here. Because there's some people, David Slepian wrote a great article, which is referenced in the book, and he asked the question, do band-limited functions really exist? Band-limited functions are smooth, and any time you stop a signal and it goes to zero, that's an abrupt stop, and that's going to generate a high frequency, and you can't get away from it. Uh, band-limited signals go on and on forever. So you have, to, you have to have a real signal that is not band limited. But what you find is that these, is that these signals are essentially band limited. In other words, these signals go from say here minus B to B And you assume that the signals are band limited. By the way, in DSP, how do you make sure that a signal is band limited? Anybody heard of the filter that you run this through? The band pass band filter? Band. Well, no, it'd be a low pass filter. Oh, yeah. A low pass filter, but I've also heard it called a brick wall filter. So you can have you can run this through a brick wall filter and literally make it band limited in order to eliminate any um, any problems with variances. Has anybody heard of a brick wall filter, which is the same as a low pass filter, an ideal low pass filter? Just when people talk about using a square wave as a filter. A square wave as a filter. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, there, there's brick wall filters. Now, can you literally have a brick wall filter? You can't if you try to do it in real time. If you capture the signal digitally, sure you can. You capture the signal digitally, you do an FFT, you, you, you take all, the, all, all of the samples outside a predefined bandwidth and then inverse the FFT, you got a pure brick wall filter. The problem is it's, it's a problem of causality, believe it or not. You can't do it in real time. Causality, which is true of temporal signals, limits you from doing this. If you have a spatial signal, you're not constrained about this. If you ever take optics and do optical signal processing, you find that nobody cares about, uh, 
Nobody cares about approximation of, of low pass filters. You can do it ideally. But wait a minute, what about that captured digital signal? Is it spatial as opposed to temporal? Yes, because you've captured it on a disk, right? And that disk is spatial. You have that, you have that time signal sampled spatially and you can deal with it as a spatial uh, signal and you can do things such as uh, brick wall filters on it. But here's the point. You have this interval of t and uh, you have this time t that you're playing at and you assume that we are going to take samples at 1 over 2b apart, right? That's the Nyquist rate. So we take samples here, 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 and here, and here, and here, and here. So we take samples 1 over 2b apart and that's as far apart as we can take samples. If we take them any wider apart, we get aliasing, don't we? So if we have a signal of interval t, and we sample at intervals of 1 over 2b, how many samples do we have altogether? t over 2b. No. Nope. Oh. oh. Notice the number, okay, here's a clue. What must the number of samples be in terms of dimension? They better be dimensionless, right? They don't have units of time or anything. It's just the number of samples. Here's the answer. 2b times t. That's the total number of samples that you have to take. As you can see, this is called the time bandwidth product. And you'll see that we have the time, right? We have the time here, and we have the bandwidth. So if we take the time and the bandwidth, the essential bandwidth, that's the time bandwidth product. And that measures the, the, the if you will, um, number of samples that we have to capture in order to faithfully represent the signal. The time bandwidth product. And so this is a very nice applied rule of thumb for uh, the um, for uh, the sampling theorem, and tells you how many samples you have to take. Okay, that continues. That that continues. That finishes the work. And I'm trying to get out of my share screen here. I've been sharing my screen, haven't I? <laughs> okay. Uh, how embarrassing for me if I hadn't been sharing my, my screen. None of you know what I was doing. Okay, I'm going to stop, stop sharing my screen here. Um, okay, that, so that's it for the sampling theorem. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a couple of assignments on, uh, for the sampling theorem on the homework and I will distribute that and um, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it Thursday and also Tuesday if you need the time. The next topic that we're going to talk about is multidimensional signal analysis and how we understand multidimensions. I will get into some of the theological implications of higher dimensions. I'm sure that some of you might be interested in that. And we'll also go into representation of higher dimensions. One of the problems that we see in business, for example, is we see these spreadsheets. You ever try to read a spreadsheet and figure out what was happening? You just go crazy. So the question, because it's a multidimensional sort of, sort of function. So the question is, is there a way that you can represent this in, in some sense that's more in tune with our senses? And we'll talk a little bit about business intelligence. That's not the focus of this course, but I thought you'd be interested in seeing it. We'll also talk about a classic book written in the 19th century called Flatland by, I think it's Edwin Abbott. And it was a book that uh, is on my top 10 that really kind of changed my life. I read it and I thought, oh my goodness, there could be a God. And uh, we'll talk about the theological implications of that too, uh, to the degree that it's appropriate. So with that, are there any questions at all? Okay, either I was very, uh, very clear or very uh, obtuse. So thank you. Thank you.